Today, we'll start by talking about enriched category theory. Um, and so, we, having defined what a monodal category is, we can generalize um, our notion of category. So, we're going to fix some monoidal category, say V. Um, so it's V. It's got a tensor product. It's got a unit. Sorry. Well, I'm going to say that that's a that's a math cal V, or um, it's a symbol. Uh, lambda rho alpha. Um, so this is a monoidal category, which we're fixing. Um, and so now we want to define a, a V category, or category enriched over V. So we'll call it C. Uh, consists of, OK, now it's going to consist of like the same things that a category consists of. So we have a collection of objects. So those are the objects in C. All right. Now, instead of having <coughs> a set of or collection of morphisms between two objects, we're going to have an object which we'll call CXY. So this is an object in V for each pair um, of objects in C. All right, so this is instead of having a set. We're having some, some object of the um, enriching category as the like concept. Um, all right. So we need a map from the, um, <coughs> the unit object. So I'll call it JX from the unit object to CXX in V. Right, so this is an object in V, this is an object in V, and we're specifying a map um, for each X and C. Um, and this is, you should think of this as the identity. <coughs> um, and then we want a map uh, which we'll denote as composition, because it's our composition from C, X, Y, Z, tensor C, X, Y, C, X, Z, in V. So if you were enriching over topological spaces, this would have to be a continuous map of topological. That, this would have to be a continuous map, um, for instance. So this is uh, for each triple x, y, z, c. OK, so somehow the point is that what we really needed from, uh, the cat like from sets as a category to define a category was we needed to like somehow define an identity and somehow define a composition. And having this, this monoidal structure is enough to do that. So for example, we can enrich over set. And if you enrich over set, you get back regular category theory. Um, it's a bit misleading to say that we can just do away with sets here, because you need to define what a monoidal category is first. And we need some notion of set to do that. Um, but category theory is like, uh, set theoretically agnostic. 
you need a notion of like collections and you need to be able to deal with size issues somehow, but it doesn't matter what version of set theory you use. Um, all right. Which this? Yes, X, Y, or in C. This map. This. I'm saying this is like this is not a set anymore. Because you, because monoidal categories don't have to have sets as their underlying object. This is just some object in V. I'm saying that this, like, this doesn't exist as anything except an object in V. There is, no, there is no set of maps between these things. I'm defining what a V category is without oh, okay. assuming anything. Right. So this is, this, for some general V category, there isn't necessarily an underlying regular category, right? Because this might not be a set. And so then there's no reasonable way to ask for it, right. ask for a regular category. Lots of the cases we care about, that is the case. Like, um, if we enrich over abelian groups, you have an underlying set, and so you do have like an underlying category. But so that's just a formal this is just a form. This is well, I mean, it's an object in here. Right? Okay, so now we need this to satisfy some things. So this is the data, and now we ask for some properties, and these properties are. Um, Recodings of the like properties that we had previously for um, for a category. So before for a category we had this data essentially, except like this was in set and this was in set, um, and we had to have like associativity and identities. So what does that mean in this case? So associativity. Well, we have C, uh, Y, and Z. Let's see. Um, X, Y. Tensor C, W, X. OK. So one way we want to do this is to compose in the first component. Uh, so here we do composition. And tensor that with the identity on this. Alternatively, using the fact that we're in a monoidal category, we can use the associator to switch the brackets around. And so now we have this. And now we can do, do it the other way around. So instead, we're taking the identity and tensoring with composition. So we're doing the composition here first. So we have C, Y, Z, tensor <coughs> C, W, Y. All right, and then we just want to do tensor. So we get W, Z, and we want these compositions to be the same. OK, so we want this to give me. So this is associativity. Um, and then identity, well, we want to have um, tensor C, X, Y. And this is going to go to C, Y, Y, tensor C, X, Y. And then we can compose two things to C, Y, X, Y. So, this should be the left unitor in V. This will be JY tensor the identity. And this will be composition. So this is one of the, um, one of the identity triangles. We have to put another one over here where we use the right unitor. Um, and instead, we have this the other way around. And we have CXY, CXX. So there's, there's another triangle. I'm not going to draw it up. But those are <coughs> those are two things. These these are the two conditions that you need to satisfy in the other triangle. 
All right. So, so examples. As I said, if V is um, set with its usual Cartesian product and the uh, and the terminal set um, as a unit, we recover uh, we recover uh, regular category theory. Um, if we take V to be a category of small categories um, with product and the one category as a unit, uh, we get two category theory. <coughs> So I think I said before that um, a category has objects which you can think of as zero morphisms, and then maps between objects which you can think of as one morphisms. A two category has um, objects or zero morphisms, and then one morphisms between objects, and then two morphisms between one morphisms. Um, and there's like a good notion of what a um, two functor is, and there's a good notion of what a, a, um, a two natural transformation is, and so on and so on. All right. Uh, pointed categories. So that's categories that have a, um, a zero object. So an object which is both initial and terminal um, are enriched over a pointed set smash uh, and the one one point set. So um, smash is. Uh, Product, but collapse the collapse the like copy corresponding to the base point of each thing. Um, it's the, it's essentially the same thing that we wrote down when we when we talked about um, smash and topological spaces. All right. Uh, ab the category of abelian groups uh, is enriched over itself. Uh, the same for, I mean, ab is z mod, and the same goes for r mod. Um, uh, in particular, uh, the category of vector spaces over some field is enriched over itself. Um, so I should say that this 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 one is is for commutative rings. I don't know or think that it holds for um, non-commutative rings. All right. So we have a notion of of enrichment for categ uh, enriched categories. We should say what the enriched versions of the other things that we um, care about are. Right. Uh, so if we have um, C and D are a pair of categories enriched over V, then a V functor uh, consists of the following information. So an assignment of objects. So we'll take objects in C to objects in D. Uh, and uh, for each um, pair, x, y, and 
see a map. Uh, we'll call it f x y. So a v functor I'm calling f. And we would write f from c to d in the way that we usually write functors. Um, a map from c x y to d f x f y. Uh, in v. Okay. Um, so if you think about it in usual in regular category theory, when we have a functor, we have a function between of maps here into maps here. Um, all right, and this needs to satisfy some things. So if we do, um, if we do composition first, And then we do this uh, functor. Fx to Fy. That should be the same as doing the functor on each part. So I'm leaving off the subscripts now. And then doing composition. So D, Fy, Fz. All right, and this is our, our usual um, uh, sort of functoriality condition um, about this is this is this is what cons this is what preserving composition turns into in the enriched case, and so if you do this in the set case, you get back the like f of um, g f equals f of g composed with f of f. Oh, yes, thank you. All right, uh, and we also need to preserve the identity. So I want that. Uh, <coughs> um, if I I want that uh, these J maps commute. With a functor, so f of x, x to f of x, and this is f. All right. So that's what it means to be a. Um, that's what it means for something to be uh, a v functor. All right. So we say that such a functor. Um, is fully faithful if this map fxy is an isomorphism for all pairs x and y all right. Uh, so we have categories, we have functors, and now we need natural transformations. And then we've sort of written down the things that category theory was supposed to talk about. Right? The point of category theory is to talk about natural transformations. So arguably, the point of enriched category theory is to talk about enriched natural transformations. So V natural transformation uh, alpha from f to g uh, between f and g from some v category c to d uh, consists of a collection. All right. 
So again, we sort of just have components for each object. So they're going to be maps from one into uh, D, F, X, G, X, X, and C. So again, if you think about what this is, if you're enriched over sets, this is saying just pick, um, pick a map between the for each x between the image of x under f and the image of g under x, which is the collection that you need in, uh, for a regular natural transformation. Um, and now we wanted to satisfy um, satisfying. We wanted to satisfy v naturality. Uh, which is now a little bit more complicated than um, our regular naturality. So we have x from CXY, and we want to go to um, by the inverse of the left unitar, so one tensor CXY. Here we want to go by the um, inverse of the right unitar to CXY. Tensor of the unit, um, and then we want to do alpha y tensor f. So alpha y gets me d f y g y, and I want to tensor that with doing f to this, which gets me d f x f y. And down here, I want to do f tensor alpha x. And that gets me d f x f y tensor d f x f x. And I want to then compose to get d f x. And asking that this hexagon commutes is V naturality. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, what have I done? Right. Yep. Uh, let me switch. OK, yes. So I want, um, that's right. Here I want a G. Uh, so here I want a G. Here I want a G. And here I want FX, GX. And so now this should be. Um, fx to gy. Yeah, OK. That's what I want to commute. Thank you. All right. Just this. OK, so given two such natural transformations, so given uh, alpha from f to g and beta from g to h, uh, the vertical composition, and I'm not going to do horizontal now, um, so it's B beta dot alpha uh, from F to H uh, has components. All right, so I need a beta dot alpha map for each X. And this is going to go from 1, because that's 
how we defined them to go to, okay, well, the, this is isomorphic to the unit tensor itself. Um, and then that's going to go to uh, beta x tensor alpha x. So that's maps from gx to hx tensor maps from fx to gx. And then we're just going to do the composition. So we get maps from fx to hx. And that's what we want. We wanted something from 1 to here to describe such a thing. Um, and we want one of these for each x and c. All right. Uh, so, alpha, some v natural transformation, is a is a v natural isomorphism. Uh, if and this is the same condition as bef as we had just with regular categories. If alpha x is an iso for all x. All right. Uh, so two v categories uh, c and d are equivalent. And this is the same, uh, 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 let's say, V equivalent. Um, and this is the same as our previous notion of equivalent. So if there exist uh, functors, V functors, um, between C and D, and V natural isomorphisms, Eta from the identity on C to GF and epsilon from FG to the identity on C. All right. And the last thing I want to put up here about this is um, is uh, a pair. of V functors like this um, is an adjoint pair uh, or a V adjunction. If uh, there exists a natural isomorphism of objects in V uh, of the form you would expect. Okay, so <coughs> somehow the point is that if I wanted, to, if we wanted to do this. Lots of the stuff that we've done in like complete abstraction, we could have started by defining what a monoidal category was, and then doing all of the stuff over enriched categories. So there are enriched versions of like most of the other things we've talked about. So there are enriched monoidal categories. There's an enriched unida lemma. There's an enriched unida embedding. There are enriched limits and colimits, called often called weighted limits and colimits. There are enriched Kahn extensions, and so on and so on. Um, and if, yeah, if we wanted to do this more abstractly, we could have started from enriched categories and done the stuff and just said, oh, everything in regular category theory is just you specialize to enrichment over set. Um, all right, how are we doing? Time is 9 past 10. Um, all right, 
So <coughs> now I want to talk about some uh, some homological algebra, um, which is to say I want to talk about abelian categories, um, which is to say I want to talk about categories enriched over abelian groups with some extra structure. Um, so this is the last thing we're going to talk about. Uh, we'll actually do something, um, which is we'll practice doing some, um, doing some diagram chasing. Uh, but first, I have a bunch of definitions to put down again. So um, so we have, we've defined what an ab category is. So ab category is a category enriched over, uh, and we're going to use ab with the tensor product and the unit is z. All right. The key consequences of this for us are, um, so I'm going to say map cal a. So um, maps between two objects forms an abelian group. Uh, so given maps, um, so we have a map from A to B, two maps from B to C, and a map from C to D. So I'm going to call this G, this G prime, this H. Um, <coughs> then we have that composing H with G plus G prime, which we can do because maps from B to C is an abelian group, um, composed with F is the same map as uh, H composed with G composed with F plus H composed with G prime composed with F. So our like addition commutes with um, composition. <coughs> so this is in maps from a to B. Uh, all right, so um, I said before that the category of abelian groups is enriched over itself. Uh, so how is, so in, in the category of abelian groups, given, given F and G from A to B, um, we can take F plus G. Uh, so we need to be able to add two maps. Uh, and I'm going to say what they do on objects um, so or elements of the group, because A and B are abelian groups here. Um, and this just takes us to FA plus FB. Uh, now, in abelian groups, we have a zero map. Um, because abelian groups is a pointed category, which is you can you can think of as the map this map, um, and it takes just a to zero in B. Um, this is identity because f plus z of a is f of a plus z of a, which is f of a plus zero, which is f of a. All right. Uh, so we also, right. Um, the fact that this operation is associative is, is, is because um, uh, this is commuted, well, this is associative in abelian groups. Um, and I'm def this 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 is this this line here is defining what it means to add morphisms, because I'm not doing this in like a generic um, ab cat. I'm doing it specifically in the category of abelian groups here. Um, so 
And then I need inverses, and I'm going to say that f bar um, is a map from a to b, which sends a to negative f of a, which again makes sense because we're in abelian groups. Um, and so uh, f plus f bar of a is f of a plus f bar of a, which is f of a minus f of a, which is 0. So f plus f bar is the 0 map, which was our identity. All right, so that's just um, like this is this is this is like point-wise. This thing becomes a becomes a, an abelian group, and that's the same way in like uh, if you enrich R modules over itself, you just enrich the home the home sets by like doing things point-wise. All right, so back to this. Um, <coughs> okay, so. Uh, we call an uh, ab functor uh, additive is called an additive functor. Um, I should also say that uh, a category enriched in abelian groups like this is often called a pre-additive category, uh, but a functor between them, given by the enrichment, is called an additive functor. <coughs> All right, so this is just a functor such that um, so it's a functor from, say, v to a, um, such that uh, this map. is a group homomorphism. OK. So I just said this was a, this, we, this is a pre-additive category. So we probably want to say what an additive category is. An additive category uh, is uh, an ab category. With a zero object and finite products. Um, this is actually enough structure to tell us that finite products and finite coproducts are the same thing in this category. Um, so, so. If you think about, say, vector spaces, which are um, enriched over, well, vector spaces are enriched over, over ab um, because vector spaces have an underlying abelian group, and vector spaces are enriched over themselves. Um, and so by being enriched over themselves, they're enriched over ab. Um, and if you think about if you think about vector spaces over some field, uh, they have a zero object, a trivial vector space, and they have all finite products. Um, and in fact, finite, like finite direct sums of vector spaces, are the same things as finite products of vector spaces. Uh, but in the infinite case, that's not true. Um, all right, so. Now we define some things within an additive category. So A and additive category. So the point of defining an additive category is to make the following definitions. <coughs> um, so uh, the kernel of a map F from A to B, uh, say F from B to C, so following what I've written down here, 
um, is the equalizer all right so we have it's the equalizer of f with 0 um, so I have a into here and if I have any other z and map equalizing this then I get a unique map Factoring through that. The co kernel of F from B to C. So this the point like the point of this is precisely to generalize the notion of kernel and co kernel in 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 groups or abelian groups. Um, is the co equalizer of the same maps. So F, 0, and C. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be the initial one of these things. So I have Y and a map equalizing, a map equalizing these two, then I get a unique map that way. All right. The image I want to stress that like this category can be enriched over abelian groups, but the objects in the enriched category don't have to be anything with sets underlying them. <coughs> the image of f from b to c uh, is right, I'm going to write m of f is the kernel of the co-kernel of f. All right, so firstly, the co-kernel is a map. It's this map c to, c to d. It's not the object d. And similarly, the kernel is a map um, here. So the image is, is a map and not, not like an object. Not, um, I mean, it's it's for a good definition of subobject. It's a subobject, but um, but you should think that all of these things I'm defining are maps. All right, and lastly, the co-image of F is co-im of F, which is the co-kernel of the kernel of f. All right. Uh, now, I'm going to define what monic and epi mean in, abelian cate in additive categories. And they don't mean the same thing as um, monomorphism and epimorphism. Um, like, the, def the definitions aren't the same. You might be able to prove that that they are the same, and that would be a good exercise. Uh, but for now, um, f from b to c is monic <coughs> if, for all um, g from a to b, uh, fg being the zero map implies that g is the zero map. Uh, and similarly, if, if we have f from b to c, um, this is epi if for all h from c to d, uh, hf being the zero map implies that h is the zero map. All right, and finally, well, we can actually define the uh, context that we do, um, I already had one. The context that we do homological algebra in, um, yeah, no, keep it here, I guess. Okay, so an abelian category.
confusingly not to be confused with an abcat. Um, is an additive category A such that, all right, we need to satisfy three things. Uh, every map has, uh, has both co-kernels and kernels. Uh, so these things are, are uh, a limit and a co-limit. They don't have to exist for every map, but we want to be in a category where they do exist for every map. Um, and then we want, oh, all right, uh, every monic is the um, is the kernel of its co-kernel. Uh, which is to say that um, F is the is its own image. Right? I want for F monic. Uh, because the the image of a map is the kernel of its co-kernel. And I'm asking for every monic to be the kernel of its co-kernel. And every epi is the co-kernel of its kernel. So that is, I'm asking for every epi that f is the co-image of f. All right. This is, this is all the structure that we need in order to be able to do homological algebra. Uh, so a sequence. Um, of maps in A, say F and G, is exact at B uh, if the kernel of G is equal to the image of F. Um, so, sorry? Yes. Um, a short exact sequence which you might call an SES uh, in A is um, something of this form. With uh, exactness at A, B, and C. Uh, so if we are in some category where like the underlying maps are sets and 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 functions, then um, like exactness is something you can check on elements, uh, and a short exact sequence means that. Um, this map is injective, and this map is surjective. Um, uh, uh, I guess I want to say that uh, um, when I say a category with, with sets underneath, I, I probably mean a category with like sets underneath and like homomorphisms as maps rather than functions, because um, yeah. All right. So uh, additive categories are what we require to be able to define um, chain complexes. Uh, you need a notion of kernel uh, and a notion of image. 
So recall that we, when we defined um, when we defined a chain complex, so it um, it was we had like objects a n plus one to a n to a n minus one, and then a ma and and it had so we had b a n plus one b a n, um, and it had to be the case that <coughs> composing two maps in a row was a zero map. Uh, and we need a zero object to be able to say what a zero map is. <coughs> um, and yeah, all right. So to define, a, to define a chain complex, you really only need to have like a zero object, right? So that we can say that this composes to the zero map. Um, and then if I wanted a map of chain complexes, it was something like this. Oh. Uh, and then I had a map like this for each um, for each n, uh, and I required that these squares commute, and that's what it meant to have a map of chain complexes. And uh, we defined this previously for abelian um, groups or R modules, but the point is that you can define this in any additive category. This is like a well-defined notion of chain complexes. Um, and abelian categories are the things that we need the structure of an abelian category to be able to define um, homology, basically. Uh, so in particular, we need in particular we need every map to have a kernel and a co-kernel, um, and we need these. But I'm not going to talk about why. Um, so some examples and non-examples. Uh, so we have the category of fields. This is uh, not additive. Uh, it doesn't have it, uh, no zero object and not all uh, products or finite products. All right, then we have, say, um, uh, abelian groups, uh, uh, abelian groups, which is Z modules, uh, and then we have R modules for some rings. These are abelian categories. So. They're enriched over abelian, over abelian, the category of abelian groups. They're additive. They have zero objects and finite products. And they're abelian. So every map has a kernel and a co-kernel and satisfies these other two conditions. Um, and then we might consider even dimensional uh, vector spaces uh, over some field. So this category is enriched over abelian groups. Uh, it is an additive category. The zero vector space is zero is zero dimension is even dimensional. Um, it has finite products because the finite product of two even dimensional vector spaces is an even dimensional vector space, but is um, not abelian uh, because odd rank maps don't have kernels, right? Because the, the kernel of, a, of an odd rank map between even dimensional vector spaces should be even dimensional. It should be odd dimensional. Um, but we don't have odd dimensional vector spaces in here. OK, so those are some. Examples of, of things. The last one's a bit contrived. There are examples of, of categories which are additive but not abelian. Um, but I couldn't be bothered looking. So I just came up with sort of the first thing that came to my head. All right. 
Uh, so now we're going to just do some diagram chasing. Um, So we're going to prove the five lemma, and then we're going to see how well I know the snake lemma off the top of my head. Um. Yes. Yes, the five lemma and the, um, the, five lemma and the, uh, the snake lemma will be in algebraic topology. Um, both play fairly important roles in some of the proofs, the snake lemma in particular. Um, but the, all right. So I, for laziness, I'm just going to work in the category of abelian groups. So you can, you can ostensibly forget everything I said about additive categories and abelian categories. We're just doing things with abelian groups. The point is that these proofs generalize to um, like, you can prove the five lemma in any abelian category. You can prove the snake lemma in any abelian category. Um, uh, and I mean, the way I'm going to do it is using elements. And not all um, abelian categories have uh, elements, like objects with like that are stre uh, sets with structure. And so. You might not always be able to use elements. Um, uh, like instead, you would use universal properties defining kernels and co-kernels and stuff. Um, but actually, uh, there's an embedding of any abelian category embeds into like some category of R modules. And so actually, you can do all your proofs using elements, but there's like a, a lot of stuff a lot of machinery between here and there, so I'm not going to talk about that. <coughs> so the five lemma. Uh, suppose that we have the following diagram, A, B, C, D, E, B, W, X, Y, Z. <coughs> Sorry? Yes, five lemma. Um, all right. We have alpha, beta, uh, gamma, delta, and epsilon. So four of these five are isomorphisms, and we have exact rows. So a, B, C, D, E is exact at B, C, and D. And V, W, X, Y, Z is exact at W, X, and Y. Uh, and I'm going to name these maps F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M. All right, so actually, we don't really need that um, these are all isomorphisms. We need these two to be isomorphisms. Uh, and we have another condition on these. But I'm just going to say isomorphisms. And if you sort through the proofs, it will be clear wh which of the things you need. OK. So now we're just doing some diagram chasing. We're chasing some elements through this diagram. And it's important to practice diagram chasing um, because once you've done it a few times, like it's always kind of obvious what you should do next. But you need to do it. If you need to actually do it a few times for that to be the case. Like when you're doing diagram chases, there's almost always only one thing you can do. Um, and if you've done you, once you've done enough of them, you're like, oh, okay, this is the only thing I can do, so I'm doing that. Um, all right. So proof. I want to show that this is inject. The gamma is injective. So oh, so the sorry, I didn't write what the actual lemma is. If you have a commutative diagram like this with exact rows and these four are isomorphisms, then the fifth one is an isomorphism. All right. So suppose uh, that we have elements C and C prime in C such that uh, gamma C 
equals gamma C prime. OK, and what I want to show for injectivity is that C and C prime are the same element in C. Then gamma of C minus C prime, which is gamma C minus gamma C prime, because this thing is a, a, a common morphism of abelian groups, um, is 0 uh, in x. All right. So uh, delta h of c c prime. So uh, c minus c prime is in here. I'm asking what happens if you take it to h, uh, take it across h, and then across delta. Well, this square commutes. So this is actually um, uh, l gamma of c minus c prime, which is L of gamma c minus c prime. And we've shown that this is 0, so this is L of 0. But this is a homomorphism of abelian groups, so this has to be 0. So if we go this way, we get 0 from c minus c prime. Um, then, because um, delta is injective because it's, a, it's an isomorphism of abelian groups. Um, H of C minus C prime is 0 as delta is injective. OK, so I mean, this was, this was delta applied to this is 0. And delta is injective, so this is 0. OK. So C minus C prime is contained in the kernel of H. So C minus C prime is in here, and it's in the kernel of this. But this top row is exact. So by exactness, kernel of H is equal to the image of G. <coughs> so C minus C prime is in the image of this map. OK. Um, so then there exists some b in b such that g of b equals c minus c prime. <coughs> now, uh, so I've got this b here. What can I do with it? Well, I know what it does across g. Let's see what it does when I go down. Um, let's say, let's see what it does when I go down and across. So I want to say what, what k beta of b is. Well, this square commutes, so this thing is equal to um, g, no, is equal to gamma g of b. Well, g of b, we've just established, is c minus c prime. So this is gamma of c minus c prime. Um, but gamma of c minus c prime was 0. OK, great. So beta b is in the kernel of k. Right, because k applied to beta of b is 0. So beta of b is in the kernel of k. But by exactness of the bottom row, the kernel of k is equal to the image of j. All right. So there exists some v in v such that uh, j of v equals beta of b. All right. But alpha is subjective. As alpha subjective, there exists some a in a such that uh, alpha of a equals v. OK. So we 
have we have that um, uh, beta f of a is okay. This square commutes now, so this is equal to. Um, J alpha of A, but alpha of A is V, so this is J of V, and J of V is uh, beta of V. OK. Uh, now, now, beta is injective. So, f of a is equal to b by injectivity. So f of a is equal to b. Um, so uh, maybe I'll line, uh, I'll line down. So f of a is equal to b, which means that b is in the image of f because there's some a mapping onto f to b but by exactness of this top row the image of f is the kernel of g so uh, g applied to b well, but that means that um, let's see c minus c prime which is equal to g of b from down here, is equal to 0. So c equals c prime. All right, and that's injectivity. This is a very typical sort of argument um, in, in homological algebra. All right, so that's injectivity. Let's do surjectivity. So I want to start with some element in x, and so there's an element in c that maps to it. So we're going to let x be an element of x. Then there exists some d and d such that uh, delta of d equals l of x. All right. So um, I don't want to say that like the way that you get to this isn't to like immediately see this. It's to say, okay, I have an element of I have an element x in here. What can I do with it? Well, I don't know anything really about this map that's helpful. And I there's no argument that I can say that it came from here, but I can apply L to it. So I'm just gonna apply L to it. Okay, now I have an element Lx. What can I say about this? Well, Delta is subjective, um, as delta is subjective. So I know that there's something in here that maps to it. And that's how you should think about how you come up with this first step. <coughs> OK. <coughs> now, I'm just going to mix it um, Now, so we have some element here. What can we do with it? Still, we don't know if it sits in the image or kernel of it, either if it sits in the kernel of this or the image of this. So we'll just push it forward. And maybe we'll push it down as well. So epsilon i of d is equal to, OK, well, that's that n square commutes. So this is equal to m delta of d. Um, and we've already established that delta of d is L of x. So this is equal to ML of x. Uh, now this is, this is 0 by exactness. So the point is that now we've said that it's mapping that this this element of z 
is mapped to by something in X across two of these, and by exactness, that has to be zero. Because the, because the image of this is equal to the kernel of this. So when X mapped, wait. Sorry. So the, so the image, this was something in here was in the L of X is in the image of L, and so it's in the kernel of N. Okay. I just want to be explicit. Um, so I of D is 0 as epsilon is injective, right? Because I did epsilon I of D and I got 0. But that means that I of D has to be 0. OK. Then we have that D is in the kernel of I which is the image of H, because this top row is exact. So there exists some C and C uh, with H of C equals D. OK, so let's see. I went to here, I sort of pulled back to an element here. And then I went down here to realize that the element that I found here was in the kernel of this map. And so then I pulled back to here. That's, this is the order in which things are happening. All right. So we have, so I've got this C. I want to do something with it. Um, maybe I'm thinking. All right, I already know what it does across H, so I'm going to push it down to gamma and see what it does. Um, so we have that L gamma of C is, again, by the fact that the square commutes equal to delta H of C. But that's delta of D. Um, which is equal to LX. So I don't know if pushing C down gamma gets me to X, but I know that pushing C down gamma and then L gets me the same thing across L. All right. Then because it gets me the same thing across L, I know that, um, I know that gamma C minus x uh, is in, wait, did I write more than that? No, OK. This is in the kernel of L, right? Because they get me the same thing when I go across. So if I take, say, like, if I take L of gamma c minus x, I get L of gamma C minus L of X, but those two are equal, so they're equal to 0. So then by exactness, this is um, in the image of K. Great. So, so there exists W in W such that K of W is equal to gamma C minus x. All right. Um, now, beta is subjective, so we can, we can take that element of w and pull it back up uh, by beta subjective. There exists b in b such that uh, beta of b equals w. <coughs> then uh, gamma of C minus G of B is equal to gamma of C minus gamma of G of B, which equals gamma of C minus, all right, gamma 
Uh, gamma of g of b, let's see. That's this. So by, commu by, by commutativity, this is, um, this is somewhere in here. Uh, k beta of b. But that's gamma of c minus k of w, which is gamma of c minus, and k of w was gamma of c minus x. So this is x. Um, so, so um, gamma is subjective. Because we found this element, c minus g of b in c, that maps onto gamma to x. And so we found an element. We're like, for any x, we can find an element that maps to it. Hence, gamma is an isomorphism. All right, so we proved the five lemma. <coughs> and if you look carefully at where we used injective and surjective, you'll see that we needed injective and surjective on both of these. But like we only needed uh, surjectivity on alpha, and we only needed um, injectivity on epsilon. All right.